What are the guiding forces in any extraordinary relationship? What keeps people out of relationships? What stops people from really experiencing the love and passion they deserve? You know, I talk to people all the time and they're, they've got everything else handled in their life. Their businesses are great. They, they have great friends. Their body's in great shape. But there's one area that so many people are missing out on and that is that deep, passionate connection with the person they desire and deserve. This film is about the kind of action you can take today to bring that emotional juice into yourself and into your partner or to attract that ideal partner to you. I can promise you that whatever stage in life you are right now, the principles you're going to learn in this series of films, audio sessions, and action workbooks will be extraordinarily useful in understanding and overcoming any challenges you may be experiencing in your relationship. I know this sounds like hyperbole, but I've got to tell you, I've been doing this for 28 years. I've worked with 3 million people live in seminars from 80 different countries in the world. At this point, I could be an idiot, and I have to say there are patterns in human behavior, and there's certainly patterns in human relationship. What you're going to learn in this series is that it starts with you, that it's your fears, it's your own limitations, it's your own patterns that get in the way of your capacity to connect and stay connected with the kind of person that would light you up and that you could light up as well. So if you really want to maximize not only the quality of your relationship, but the joy and fulfillment that you experience together, then I'm going to ask you not only to listen to these films, but in some cases, listen or watch them again and again and get the repetition in your body. But most importantly, take the actions I'm suggesting. Don't just take the information, and that's fine to start with, but action's what's going to change your life. Now, in this session, you're going to listen to a conversation I had with a young woman named Tawny, a beautiful young woman. She had an extraordinarily successful career. She had great friends, great relationship with her mom, but she found herself struggling with depression. Now, how do you do that? How does that happen? How do you struggle with depression when you've got everything going for you? So many people do. And the reason is you're going to learn a principle in this first tape that's crucial to understanding yourself or any other human being's behavior. If you've ever asked, why did I do that? Or how the heck could this person do that? I'm going to tell you the answer. Whatever human beings do, they have a reason. They have a specific reason. It may not be conscious, it may be unconscious, but I'll tell you what it is. This behavior, even if it's painful on the surface, meets a need within this individual. We all have six human needs, and part of what you're going to learn during this series is human needs psychology. The fundamental, basic understandings of what makes us do what we do, what drives us, what shapes the way that we function as human beings. These drives, these belief systems, and the emotions that we've learned to live with, that we've gotten used to, the frustration or the depression or the joy or the happiness, whatever your emotional habits are, the beliefs you have and the drives that are the focus of your life are affecting everything in your life, not only your relationship, but your body, your emotions, your finances, and everything else in between. So remember, if a, someone continues to do a behavior, even a behavior that seems hurtful, it's being reinforced by something. There's some need being met, and that's the mystery that will be uncovered in this conversation with Tani. You'll see that this emotional pattern of depression, or for some people it could be anger, or somebody else would be guilt or distrust or whatever, it can take root in anybody's life, and it starts to take control of your life, your relationship, and it gets in the way of everything that you want to create in your life, everything you want to really accomplish, or at least parts of your life, because some people are doing great in their career, but they've got a terrible relationship with their kids, or they're great with their kids, but they're overweight, or their weight's in great shape, but they're broke, or in this case, everything else is great, but their relationships suck. <laughs> to be a technical term. So the bottom line is, as the conversation unfolds, listen for and notice how Tawny actually uses depression unconsciously to meet some of her needs, but in a way that unfortunately is destructive to herself and some of the people she loves most and cares about most. Here's going to be the secret of this tape. Once you recognize these patterns, you're going to learn ways to make choices, to intervene in these patterns that may have been guiding your life for a long time, to make a breakthrough, to make a bold new life by making brand new decisions and taking action on them immediately with passion and emotional juice so you get what you deserve. That's what it's all about. And by the way, I'm happy to tell you the postscript to this story so you have a reason to listen and say, hey, does this stuff really work? Well, I can tell you, three years later, her life has been completely transformed. First of all, within a few months, this decision she couldn't make and couldn't figure out who she wanted to be with her life, she got married. 
She also started a brand new business with her husband, left the business she was totally successful in and had the courage to move to a brand new state. And now, three years later, she's on track this year to make over half a million dollars a year. Now, the money's not that important, although I'm sure it's nice for her. What's really magnificent is that she's living her dream life with her dream man. A complete transformation like this can happen to anyone when you begin to understand what's driving you, the beliefs that are holding you back, the fears that are controlling you, and the emotions and what you're getting out of them. I mean, this is an opportunity for you, not just to learn about Tawny, but to learn about you, to learn about the people you care about, so you could really make that difference in yourself or anybody else you'd like to make a difference for. I hope you'll listen, I hope you'll take notes, and I hope you'll take action as if you were gonna try and teach this or share this with someone you love. My deepest, sincerest desire is that this conversation, this series of conversations and films, the workbooks and actions that are provided that are so simple can give you the life that you deserve. How this process ideally works is simple. You can watch these films, or some people very often will listen to them because they can do it while they're working out or driving in their car and so forth, and you'll get some of the same benefit. On the film, you'll be able to see the facial expressions and so forth, so I encourage you to do either or both. But as you immerse in these experiences, you're going to be learning consciously and unconsciously. Most of us don't realize that most of what we know, we've learned unconsciously. When you're in immersion, you'll make distinctions you're not even aware of, and you'll find you'll start using them. But also, you're going to learn explicitly, because Chloe Madonis is my partner here. She is world-renowned as a teacher of psychotherapy. She's been doing this for more than 35 years. She's been rated as one of the top 10 therapists in the world. The breadth of experience she has is amazing, and I'm privileged to have her as a partner and to be in these tapes with you to help guide you on this amazing journey because she's going to point out to you what's happening along the way for your conscious mind to notice. And at first you might not say, well, I don't really care, but after a while it'll start to accumulate and you'll look forward to what she's going to share. Because It's kind of like when you're building a puzzle, as you start to put pieces in place, you don't really know, it doesn't look like anything, and then there's a point, like a tipping point, where all of a sudden, even though it's not done, you'll see it done. You'll see everything. You'll start to hear conversations between couples and you go, that's what's happening. Oh my God, that's what I'm doing. So that's why we have a series of films. What you're gonna learn in this series is a practical psychology, a fundamental way of understanding what makes you do what you do and what makes other people do what they do. Something that's actionable, not something that's technical, not something that analyzes or analyzes your past, but something that's fundamentally useful. And I call it human need psychology. And in it, you're gonna basically learn three things. You're gonna learn what's the driving force of your life. What is it that drives you most? What are the needs that drive you and every other human being in this world that helps you understand why we do what we do? Secondly, we're gonna learn what are the guiding forces of your life. If you're trying to feel significant as a need or you're trying to feel loved as a need or feel certain, whatever the need is, how you go about doing that is different for everyone because we have different beliefs. Those are our guiding maps, the maps of meaning and action that tell us what this means and what we gotta do. Some people, the way to be significant is to take advantage of everybody, you know, to outthink them or screw them over. Somebody else's idea is to contribute more, to give more, to love more. Some people's idea of love is to take it. Others is to give it. Others is to share it. Everyone has different belief systems, and our beliefs guide our behaviors. And finally, all of this is fueled by the third force, the fuel of choice. While there are thousands of emotions we could feel, each of us tend to specialize in about a dozen or so, where you know people don't feel every emotion every day, every week. They feel pretty much the same group of about a dozen emotions. Half a dozen make them feel good, and half a dozen make them feel bad overall. You know, people get really worried and frustrated and freaked out and angry and scared, or and they get really happy and excited and hopeful and loving and playful, and then they get scared and freaked out and frustrated again. And we tend to go in cycles. When you identify the fuel of choice, you can change it. Because guess what? No matter what relationship you're in, if your habit is to get frustrated, you're going to get frustrated no matter who you're with because you find your way back home to the place you know. If you're a happy person, all hell breaks loose. You still find a way to find the good in it, don't you? That's the center of gravity. And for some of us, that center of gravity has to change. For some of us, the guiding forces have to change because the beliefs we have about relationships create pain for us. And for some of us, we're trying to get something out of a relationship instead of give it. We're trying to get significance, or we're trying to be certain in a relationship and control someone, which even if you succeed, will make you bored, unhappy, and make the other person feel unloved. So these fundamentals will be covered over the course of this time. In this film, however, we're going to answer three questions. Question number one is, what stops you? I mean, I know there are things in your life 
that you want to do, that you know what to do, but you still don't do it. Isn't it true? We all have things like that at times. And the question is, when you know what you should do and you don't do it, why not? And you know the answer. It's fear. But which fears? And how do we utilize them? The second question we're going to answer here is, what is the force that shapes and controls every thought, feeling, and emotion in our life? And the answer to that is going to be the meaning we attach to something. When something happens, the way we feel about it is based on the meaning. Is it the end or the beginning? Is God punishing you or rewarding you? I mean, whichever meaning you come up with radically changes how you feel and the experience of your life. And then the third question, what is the controlling force? Why do we do what we do? Why is it at times we do things that don't seem to be our advantage? Why do we sabotage ourselves at times, at least on the surface it seems like that? Why is it that people do silly things, stupid things, unconscious things? We're going to learn about these needs that they're controlling for us. And most importantly, how can you take this understanding and use it to change anything in your life? Most importantly, your intimate relationships. So I hope this sounds compelling to you. There's a lot to cover here, but I think you're going to find it real. This is raw and real. These are real people, unscripted, with real reactions. And I'll let you know that, you know, there'll be some bleeping in here and some sounds because... You know, we have here language designed to get people to reality. Most people use softeners in life. How you doing? Oh, pretty good. When they really mean I feel like hell or something 10 times worse than that. One of the things that Freud learned, he used language that was very direct. He used sexual language. He used direct language because what he wanted to do was to get people to the truth, raw. And that language disturbs us. If we say the word rear, your rear end, no problem, but if somebody says ass, you have a different feeling, but it's the same thing we're talking about. It's just the word. But I will use words at times to shock, to disturb, to open somebody up, never to be disrespectful, as I'm sure you'll clearly see, and using these principles based upon the concept of how do you open someone to the truth? How do we get to what's real instead of the cover-ups that we have? Never in a harsh way. So please join me right now, and let's experience this film or this audio, however you're going to go about doing it, and let's begin to discover what really drives us. In fact, the answer to three questions. What is it that stops us from doing what we know we need to do? What controls and shapes every thought, feeling, and emotion in our life? And why do we do what we do, and how can we change it? Because with the answers to these questions, you can make any relationship magnificent. Let's begin now. What stops us from having the life we want? What is the force that shapes and controls the quality of our lives? Why do we do the things we do? All of us have dreams and desires for our lives, our careers, our families, and our relationships. However, for most of us, it is difficult to experience the happiness we seek. In this film, you will learn about fundamental patterns that drive human behavior and control our relationships. We begin our story with Anthony Robbins speaking at a conference before 3,000 people. In order to show how quickly people can change their emotions, he asks for a show of hands from people who suffer from depression. Tani is an attractive, intelligent young woman who uses depression to get sympathy and love. However, she gets caught up in the idea of being depressed and ends up feeling unhappy and alienating those around her. Using human need psychology, Robbins will elucidate how Tani's emotional patterns function to bring on suffering. By clarifying these core emotional patterns, Tani is able to develop the self-awareness necessary to avoid using depression and instead to make bold new decisions. Today, she lives a radically different life that makes her proud. Robbins will first demonstrate the principle of the triad. All behaviors, including emotions, are made up of three elements working together. Patterns of physiology and posture influence your biochemical state and thus your emotions. Patterns of mental focus determine how you experience the world. And thirdly, patterns of language control the way you express and represent your experience to yourself and to others. These three, physiology, focus, and language, create the meanings that determine the way we experience our life. In order to be depressed, a person must assume a certain posture, focus on certain specific things, and use certain specific language patterns that lead to depression. 
Robbins will begin by asking Tani to deliberately put herself into a state of depression so that the audience can see what patterns of physiology, focus, and language are necessary for her to feel depressed. Okay, where's the lady right here who just raised her hand? I just saw it. Yes, ma'am. Would you stand up for a moment? What's your name? Tawny. Can we get a microphone for Tawny? Now, you don't look very depressed right now. Are you really depressed right now? Yeah. You are. I see. How depressed on you on a zero to ten scale? Ten is totally depressed, want to kill yourself. Zero is not depressed at all. About an eight. About an eight. Interesting. About an eight. And um, you're feeling that right now? Actually, I'm doing pretty good since I've been here. Yeah, you're doing better right now. How many saw she was not depressed just now? Let me see a show of hands if you saw. Okay. But you could get there if, if you wanted to, right? Right now, you're not actually depressed. What are you feeling right now? Hopeful. Hopeful. By the way, how many saw that in her body? In talking to Robbins, Tani is momentarily hopeful. Robbins points out that when Tani feels emotional states, these states are linked to physiological patterns in her body. I want you to notice, I want you to notice Tani's physiology right now when she's hopeful. If you notice, She's got one arm here, but the other one is loose. And she's smiling, and her head's kind of bouncing like this. That's called hopeful for her. And you can see, now it's even more than hopeful right now. There's a different feeling she just had as I point this out. That's not depressed. And she smiled. How many of you felt when she took the microphone she was not depressed? Let me see your hands. Now, how come 3,000 people all knew that? Because you're all natural psychologists, and you know that is not depression. Now, you can fake somewhat, but if you're totally depressed, you couldn't have smiled as big as she did and she would have been not in the same position. Robbins sees that Tani's depression is not life-threatening, though it creates real problems for her. He will now ask her to deliberately make herself depressed in order to investigate how she does it. Now what I'd like you to do for me is I'd like you to get depressed. Can you get depressed for me? It's pretty easy. Okay, show me how to do it because I'm not very successful at this. <laughs> Really get depressed right now. I, I mean it for, for real. Get really depressed. There you go. And now I want you to double the depression, whatever you got to do. Do what you do with your body when you're twice as depressed. Focus on what you focus on when you're twice as depressed. Say to yourself what you say when you're, there you go, when you're really depressed. How depressed are you right now? Zero to ten. Stay in that state and just tell me how depressed. Zero to ten. Pretty depressed. Your 10 is want to kill yourself, zero is not depressed at all. Where are you? About, about nine. Okay, now stay there in that state so we can learn something. How many saw her change her physiology radically to go into depression? Raise your hand. What did she specifically do to go from hopeful to depressed? By the way, how fast did she go from hopeful to depressed? How fast? In a heartbeat. What'd she change? Someone tell me. Posture. What part? What happened? Where did her head go? Heads down. What else changed? Stay in that, oh, stay depressed. You're going to screw this up. Stay depressed. I don't want you getting happy on me. Don't you get happy on me. You stay depressed, damn it. Robbins has demonstrated how quickly Tani can take herself from hopeful to depressed and then to laughter. He pretends to be angry and disappointed that she cannot maintain her depression, and he uses surprising and shocking language to trigger a heightened emotional state that will help her to learn and remember. Laughing is the worst thing you can do to be... You stop laughing, bitch. Don't you smile. Go back to depression. Come on. Give me a little help here. That's it. That's it. Good. Get that hand back up. Good. That's good. That helps. How many notice that hand's really important to the depression thing? So she dropped her head. What happened to her breathing? Full or shallow? It started to get shallow. Heads down. What happened to her shoulders? Down. Go. Stay there. Stay there. Down. Right? So shallow breathing, head down. What else did you notice? Come on. What else did you notice? She started squeezing her hand on that microphone tight. Did you notice that? Tension. Tapping the microphone, that tension. Now that Robbins has pointed out the physiological pattern in Tani's depression, he will ask her what she focuses on in order to feel depressed. Now that's just the physical side. Now as you stay in this state, tell me, what are you focusing on to be depressed at level nine? My lack of happiness. Your lack of happiness. Mm -hmm. 
And when you say you're focused on your lack of happiness, what do you picture? What do you think about? By not being able to stop crying a lot lately. Could you get to crying for us? Could you get that depressed? <laughs> oh, come on. You can do it. If you're able to get to the place of not being able to stop, let's go there. That's a much better example. I'm not, I'm not being able to put my past behind me. Not able to put your past behind you. What do you focus on in your past in order to be depressed? Just say it. My, my lack of trust in, in people. Your lack of trust in people or in men? Men. Bet you're glad you volunteered for this, aren't you? By the way, I'm a man. <laughs> Tani put herself again in a depressed state through her physical posture, her breathing, and her thought process. Robbins will now humorously provoke her into another emotional state to continue to show how easy it is to go from one emotional state to another. What does that microphone remind you of? What are you feeling right now? Actually, a little pissed. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> By the way, pissed is much better than depressed. What'd she do? She brought her head back up, her shoulders back up. She's still tense, but she's like, don't f with me. So pissed might be a more useful state. It's certainly not the end all and be all, but she can get out of depression and go pissed real quickly. In fact, I bet you've done this plenty of times. When she gets tired of being sad, she gets pissed. Am I right? Yeah. I call this a crazy eight. She gets really depressed and tired and feels helpless, and she gets tired of feeling that feeling. I'll explain why later. And then she gets pissed, which makes her feel strong for a short time. And then she's tired of being pissed, so she goes back to connecting with herself and feeling sad again. And she gets tired, then she gets pissed. This is a very simple pattern, and it's not unique. And she's good at it because she's practiced it for years, true? I'm the master. Yes, I can see that. For Tani, depression is a way for her to connect and commiserate with herself. However, when this depression begins to make her feel too weak, she snaps out of it with anger. This emotional pattern of alternating between sadness and anger is called a crazy eight. Many people live most of their lives alternating between these two emotions. Let's go back to depressed, though, because it's so much more fun. Uh. Go back to depressed. Okay. Notice she knows exactly where to go. Does she know what to do to get depressed, yes or no? She would have you believe that happens to her. Go ahead, get depressed. Level eight, nod when you're there, okay? Tell me what you're focusing on right now to be depressed at level eight. I don't know. You're not there? <clears throat> what are you focused on? The men that you can't trust from your past. What do you say to yourself to be depressed like this? Just say out loud what you're saying in your head when you're really depressed. When people experience emotions, they are actually saying things to themselves silently. Although they are not said aloud, these language patterns have a powerful influence on our emotions. I'm so pathetic. <laughs> I'm so pathetic. Say it in the tone of voice you say it when you stay depressed, though. You're so fucking pathetic. To really be depressed, what do you got to say to yourself? Really depressed. Nine. Say it in the tone of voice you say it when you're that depressed. I don't want to live my life this way. What else do you say? You're so pathetic. I don't want to live my life this way. Is there a tone of voice here, ladies and gentlemen, yes or no? What else do you say to stay depressed at level nine? You ever get depressed at 10, like where you want to kill yourself? No? No. Shit, I thought we had a good suicide we could deal with here. Sorry to disappoint you. What are you doing smiling in? <laughs> what are you feeling right now? I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> how fast can we take her out of depression? How fast? Two seconds. If you f*** with her depression, she's pissed off at you. <laughs> I'm sitting here being depressed. You can take me out of it. I'll come out of my depression when I'm ready. When Robbins surprises her and interferes with her depression, Tony reacts with anger. She is protective of her depression because she has been using it to satisfy an emotional need. Take a moment and ask yourself, if she protects her right to be depressed by being angry, how would that affect her relationships? What would happen if someone tried to help her overcome her depression? Do you know anyone who protects his or her depression or another destructive emotion? For Tani, this is a turning point. 
She sees the way she uses depression and she will look for new ways to meet her emotional needs. So we now know what she does when she's pissed and we know what she does when she's depressed and she seems to snap back. Let's go back to hopeful for a second. You got me. You, you're good. Now, how many, how many recognize the physiology of hopeful when she went there? Raise your hand if you recognize it. What did she do? She started doing what? Nine her head, shoulders came back, head came up. What else did she do? Start to smile. So can she go from depressed to hopeful instead of depressed to pissed if she chose to? These are wimpy ass states. Have you ever had a state of pure ecstasy? Oh, yeah. Or is that what you're pissed about? That's not my problem. Good. What are you feeling now? Excited. Excited. That's nice. In order to learn how to overcome her habit of depression, Tani needs to work on an antidote, a strong emotional state that will meet her emotional needs while counteracting depression. Robbins will suggest that she train herself in the emotion of ecstasy. I'd like you to think of a specific peak experience in which you experienced a peak of ecstasy. Can you remember a particular moment? Oh, yeah. I'd like you to go right before the peak of that moment. And as you do that, I want you to step into that image as if you were really there. And breathe the way you're breathing right near the peak. Were you making sounds at this point? Right, what are you feeling right now? Stay in that state. What are you feeling right now? <laughs> She's feeling so much she can't talk. Now go back to depression. This is better. No, go back to depression. Come on, you've been there for years. <coughs> go to depression, come on. You can't put your past behind you. See, if you can't put your past behind you, in this case, I think that's a very good thing. Because if this was constantly in front of you, imagine the smile that would be on your face all day. <laughs> Maybe you've been selective about which past to put in front of you or behind you. I know that's, for sure. that's true. In conducting his interventions with people, Robbins is following seven master steps for creating lasting change. First, understand their world. Robbins began by understanding Tani's triad, the patterns of physiology, focus, and language, which come together to create the experience of depression. He also understood her typical crazy eight emotional pattern and the source of pain in her life her difficulty in relationships. Second, break the pattern. Using humor, challenge, and surprising language, Robbins continuously broke Tani's habitual emotional patterns. Third, find leverage. Robbins found leverage by locating what Tani cared about most, her desire for a loving, trusting relationship with a man. When Tani saw a chance to change this part of her life, she committed herself fully to the intervention. Fourth, Robbins redefined the problem. Tani's problem wasn't depression. Depression was just a way of meeting her needs in the short term that was actually destructive in the long term. What Tani really wanted was a relationship and another way to live. With depression out of the way, she can now make that change. Fifth, Robbins created alternatives for Tani. Instead of always spiraling into depression, Tani can learn to access emotions such as ecstasy and hope. The sixth step is condition the new behavior, and the seventh step is to relate the change to a higher purpose. Now Robbins will undertake step six to discuss the way Tani has conditioned herself to go into depression and how she can condition herself to make a conscious choice. Does she have the ability to go from depressed to pissed to hopeful or to ecstatic in a matter of seconds, yes or no? Does she have the ability, yes or no? Has she proven to you that she can do them quickly and immediately, yes or no? Then why in the past has she gone to depression when she has all these other choices? Because she's been rewarded for it. Yeah, that's for sure. Is that fair to say? That's why she didn't like me very much when I was showing that it's all a game she's been playing for years. 
Now, she doesn't just do it consciously. I know you're not a manipulating bitch who's just doing this to get something. True? That's true. There are times when you're doing it consciously. True? That's also true. I appreciate your honesty. First of all, would you give her a big hand for that honesty? It's fantastic. I, I, I really honor you. First of all, I appreciate your courage to even stand up. I appreciate you playing with me because it's not a comfortable thing. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate most and honor most your honesty because with that honesty, you can change anything. Most people can never get to that level of honesty, so they have no power. And the reason they're most dishonest is with themselves. Because it doesn't feel good to say, yeah, I've used this shit at times. Um, but you know you have, and you're honest about it. That means you can change it. Now Tani understands her pattern of being depressed in the hope that she would be loved and taken care of, and then being angry because of the feeling of helplessness brought on by depression. This crazy eight is a common way to resolve our contradictory needs for feeling connected and vulnerable, and for feeling powerful and in control. Now Robbins will move into step seven, relate to a higher purpose. He will show Tani that the radical swings of her crazy eight are not necessary when she is connected to her higher purpose and her true self. But you gotta set up a new reward system for yourself. The other thing is, you've gotten in the habit of doing it that sometimes you just do it unconsciously now because you've gotten in this, what I call crazy eight, this loop. And you like the pissed part because it makes you feel powerful. That's true. Because you feel really non-powerful in the other state, which you also like. Because you live in a world where women are no longer honored for their feminine. They're all supposed to be men now. So your one way to get feminine is to get broken. And feminine isn't about broken. Feminine is about feeling. But it's not okay for you to feel. So you go there and you've got enough reason to be depressed and you can feel that and maybe actually have some people step up and take care of you and honor you, a masculine energy, instead of you always being in control, but you also, you're addicted to that control. And you call pissed off as your way of mobilizing. Now you mobilize with that pissed off and it's a useful skill, I know how to do it too, but it's not very feminine and that doesn't mean you have to be feminine every minute. I know any woman in this room can kick any man's ass in just about anything business-wise at this stage as any man can do with any woman. It's, it, there's, no, there's no gender bias anymore. And a woman can do anything with a man can do and do things a man can't do. Like she can have a kid without a man today. So I want you to notice how you're feeling right now. I just saw a really beautiful smile and it wasn't a forced smile of hopefulness. And it wasn't a smile of, you just did something cool. What was that smile that I just saw? Do you remember a moment just a second ago? Comfort. Comfort. How did that feel? Yeah, it feels good. How would you compare that feeling to depression? Yeah, there's no comparison. Mm. How would you compare it to pissed? Yeah, it doesn't measure. What you just saw in her, if you saw her, was how many saw that relaxation smile? How many saw that? I'm just curious. What happened is she went home for a few moments when I described what her real nature is like. You're a very feminine woman, but you have trained yourself to, to kick ass. And out of all the pain you've had, you've gotten really tough. And the tougher you've got, the more you've lost your soul. Not your soul, that's not fair to say. The feeling of being connected to your soul. Because you've covered it all up. That's really what's depressed you. But you've gotten addicted to the feeling of getting tough and feeling sad because the sad is the one time you allow yourself to be feminine because in the feminine you don't have to control you just allow it to be and if you allow it to be long enough it's going to change anyway if you do nothing men think they got to control it and make it happen and do all those things a woman doesn't have to do that if she's in her natural feminine state and i'm saying this because you're the only person in this room i'm talking to right now there are no other men and women that this relates to in this room of three thousand people but if they were listening to me right now they might discover that the greatest happiness in life comes when you get back to your true nature. First of all, I really want to thank you sincerely and honor you. Afterwards, I'm going to ask you to diagnose yourself with what I'm about to share, which is the specific reason why you've really done this, why anyone does anything. And I'd like you to diagnose it, but I really, truly want to honor you, and I hope everyone else will, for your total sincerity and honesty and all that you've shared with us here. Give her a big hand. Ramiz asked Tani to show him what she does to get depressed. He then noticed her physiological posture, her pattern of focus, and the language patterns which came together for Tani as the experience of depression. While she was depressed, he provoked her, and she snapped out of her depression with anger. This was Tani's predominant pattern, a crazy eight. She would get depressed in the hope that she would be loved and taken care of, but when she felt weak and helpless, 
she would get angry to snap out of the depression. In fact, Tani even got angry to protect her right to be depressed. This shows that at some level she holds on to her depression because it satisfies a need for her. As Tani sits down, Robbins will make a presentation on the six human needs, specifically gearing his talk to help her understand more deeply how she uses depression to meet her needs. We only do things because at some level, consciously or subconsciously, we believe we will meet one or more of what I call our six human needs. I am here to tell you, having been with three million people from all over this planet, that while we're all completely diverse in our physiologies, the way we look, think, act, behave, one thing I can tell you for sure, we're hardwired with the same needs. Most people keep their problems because it meets their needs, and it meets their needs without risking their greatest fear. This is a key concept in human needs psychology. We recognize two kinds of problems, quality problems and safe problems. Quality problems involve a risky, forward-thinking decision that will often take you to another stage in life. This decision could be something like making a career shift, committing to a relationship, starting a family, or even leaving a relationship or moving. It can also be a risky interpersonal communication that leaves you vulnerable. Telling someone that you love them, confronting someone about an injustice, or asking someone for help. Sometimes quality decisions are simple, like deciding to appreciate yourself and others, or cultivating a feeling of gratitude. Safe problems, on the other hand, are lingering issues which, strictly speaking, lie within our control. Depression, procrastination, hesitation, food and other addictions, blaming others for your troubles, avoiding decisions, or withdrawing from relationships. Safe problems seem safe because they seem to protect us from our fear that if we try and fail, we won't be enough and won't be loved. Of course, in the long run, it is safe problems such as depression and addictions which cause more damage to our bodies, our spirit, and our relationships than risky problems ever do. When people come up against a risky decision that they feel unwilling to make, they will often develop a safe problem that will distract them from making a risky decision. For instance, Tani stood up with a problem of depression, a safe problem that, strictly speaking, lies within her control. Robbins discovered that Tani's greater fear lay in a risky decision, how to trust a man and develop the relationship she wants in life. Most ways to meet your needs, you'd have to take a risk like start to get in a relationship, and that brings up a big risk. In fact, the primary fear that we will, are not enough and won't be loved, guess where it shows up more than any other place? An intimate relationship. Because look, that's why most people spend more time at work or with their kids. Because with their kids, they figure, I got this love forever. On the other hand, work. You can control it by your effort, by your focus, by your commitment to do well in work. You have control of that. No control in a relationship. Influence at best, that's what you have. So it's scary as hell for people. I don't care what the situation is. If you don't get your relationship where you want it to be, you're going to be in pain. The first of the six human needs, I believe, is the need for certainty. Think of certainty as the ability to avoid pain and the ability to have pleasure. At least to avoid pain. Because avoiding pain is a survival instinct. It's hardwired into us to have some level of certainty just to survive. So we need certainty. Everybody needs it. The only question is how much of it you think you've got to have. I'll tell you this. The quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably live with. The more uncertainty you can live with, the more you'll try, the more you'll learn, the more alive you'll be. The more you've got to be certain about everything, the less you'll have. So in this young lady's case, she really wants certainty that this next relationship won't hurt her. And yet she needs certainty. So how is she going to get it? Well, she can do it by being incredibly intense about the men she's with and really screening the hell out of them. But if she screens the hell out of them, many of them are going to feel judged and think, why would I want to be around this bitch? So there's many ways to get certainty. You can get certainty by eating. It's when you overeat, all the blood rushes in your stomach, and you start breathing again. You can do it by smoking. Deep diaphragmic breath happens. You can do it by drugs. You can do it by just looking at your history and saying, you know what, I've always found a way. Isn't that amazing? And I will again.
Just trust it. Based on your history, you've always found the way. You can do it through a spiritual belief. You can do it in positive ways, neutral ways, or destructive ways. Because everybody finds a way to meet their need for certainty. Everyone, even crazy people. Everybody finds a way. The only question is, are you going to find a way, that's, a way that's obtainable or sustainable? Everybody obtains certainty. The question is, can you sustain it? And can you do it in a way that sustains you long term? Take a moment to consider, what are some of the ways that you use to get the feeling of certainty? What do you do with your physiology, eat, sleep, exercise, the way you breathe or stand? What do you do with your focus in order to feel certain? Do you have an empowering belief? Do you focus on your future or your past? What language patterns do you use? Are there phrases you use regularly? If you like, pause the film for a moment and write this down. Now Robbins will explain the second human need, uncertainty. How many of you in this room, tell me honestly, how many of you love surprises? You do say, I. Bullshit. You like the surprises you want. The surprises you don't want, you call problems. And you don't want those. But you need them. Because they're the things that make you grow. See, what we need is variety to be alive. We need stimulation. We need the unknown or we feel dead inside. See, you can get variety by doing drugs because variety is just a change in state. You can get variety by eating. That's why people get addicted to food because they can get comfort and variety. Drugs, comfort and variety. You're all bored or frustrated. You go smoke and it changes your state. Variety and you're comfortable. Ah, oh, it meets two of my needs. Interesting. You can also get variety in positive ways, like taking on a new challenge, setting a new goal. You can get variety in a conversation. If someone says, life's so boring, man, I go, no, life isn't boring. You're boring. Could you sit in a room with nothing else there and have unlimited variety if you just used your brain, yes or no? See, variety is available at any moment. Most people value certainty more. That's why their life is so boring. We tend to pick, of these six, we tend to pick one or two that we value more and it shapes the direction of our life. People that are certainty driven end up with a very different life than people that are variety driven. What are some of the ways that you use to meet your need for uncertainty and variety? What do you do with your physiology, with your focus and with your language? Now Robbins will explain the third human need, significance. Third human need, the need for significance. We all have a need to feel significant, to feel important, to feel special, to feel unique. The word significance has many different connotations. Uniqueness, special. We all have the feeling of wanting to be needed, to feel important. These are all code words for significance. Who has this need? Every human being you're ever going to meet in your life. All of us have it. The only difference is how we go about it. Some people try to be significant by achieving everything. Some people try to be significant by breaking through big problems. Some people get significance by having more earrings and more locations than you'd want to ever describe. Some do it by being unique in their tattoos. Some by having a unique hairstyle. Some people by their style of how they walk or how they talk or their humor. Everybody finds a way to be unique or special or to feel needed or to feel important. It's a human need that everyone has, even those who deny it. You can get significance in a positive way, a neutral way, or a negative way. One of the fastest ways to significance with strangers is violence. If you go up here to the hood, not far from here, and I come up and put a gun to your head, guess what? I am instantly significant. I don't need a college education. I don't need to work at it. I don't do anything. And I am certain you're going to respond to me. I've met two of my needs. And there's variety because who knows what's going to happen next. It's different every time. By the way, anytime something you do or believe you associate to that meaning at least three of your needs, you become addicted to it. Positive or negative doesn't matter. So if you've got a big enough problem, because there's two ways to get significance. Take a huge risk, potentially fail, and look like you're unworthy and worthless and not worthy of love and face your deepest fear on earth, or have a really big problem you can share with everybody. A significant problem that's so bad that you can tell everybody about it and now you don't ever have to face your fears and you can feel significant, which is the choice most people make. Think of a problem that you have struggled with or a complaint you have had for an extended time. If you have continued to focus on it without resolving it, odds are that it has helped you to meet your need for significance. The majority of people in the world 
try to find big enough problems so that they never have to beat themselves up for not being enough or so at least they can defend themselves against themselves or other people when they want to know why they haven't done it. It's not that you're gutless. It's not that you're worthless and you're not loved. It's just this horrible thing that happened to you. Funny thing, other people have had much more horrible things and they've managed to succeed. But that would require a level of truth that very few people have. This young lady in the middle row here certainly does have. And the minute you have that level of honesty, you have the power to change it. If we want to be significant, we can do it in negative ways, positive ways. You can be a troublemaker and be significant. You can be a contributor and be significant. How do you get significance? Do you do it through business, achievement? Do you do it by being the best parent? Do you do it by the way you dress? Do you do it by being tough and you can handle anybody no matter what they do with you? Do you do it by having a really big problem that you can demonstrate at will? How do you do it? Now, here's the problem. To be totally significant, you've got to be totally unique and different. To be totally unique and different violates your fourth human need, one of the deepest ones, the need for connection and love. Because the more different you have to be, the less connected you can be. So love or connection, most people settle for connection because it's a lot less scary. They don't have to put as much out there, can't be hurt as bad. So you settle for connection instead of love because, ooh, love, that's a very scary thing. You can get connection. The fastest way to get connection is to have a problem. See, go out and do extremely well and see how many people are thrilled for you and for how long. Most people, when they see you succeed, they look and evaluate themselves. And even though you may think they're phenomenal, they don't think they're phenomenal. And so what they begin to do is feel insignificant because of your achievements. Now they have one or two choices. Get out there and face their risks and kick ass and do something, which takes enormous fear, overcoming enormous fear, or tear you down. Which one do you think is faster and easier and more predictable? Tear you down. You can get connection by loving someone. You can get connection by making love. You can get connection by prayer. You can get connection by walking through nature. You can get connection by getting really sick and people come and want to take care of you. What are some of the ways that you use to get the feeling of connection? Do you get it by giving or by receiving or both? What do you do in order to receive from others? How do you give love and connection to others? Do you experience love on a regular basis or do you hold back from love? Now Robbins will explain the final two needs, growth and contribution. The first four needs are the needs of your personality. Everybody meets them even if you've got to lie to yourself. The final two you can only meet by really doing something. And the final two is number five is you must grow. In fact, if you don't grow, you what? You know the answer. You what? You die. And number six, you must contribute beyond yourself. You must contribute beyond yourself because if life is just about you, I got news for you. You can make yourself feel pleasure for a moment because somebody complimented you or because you made a certain idea come through you or because, you know, some situation you did really well. But that's a temporary pleasure. Fulfillment stays with you. Fulfillment only comes when you know you've grown and when you know you've contributed beyond yourself because life is not just about us. And everything in the universe either contributes or is eliminated by evolution. These are the primary needs of all human beings, and very few human beings meet these on a regular basis. Now, I took a lot of time to do this because I don't want you to be passive with me. I want you to be active. So when somebody stands up, I want you to become the practical psychologist, the natural psychologist who starts to say, why are they doing this? Oh, they're meeting this need, this, this need. Interesting. How are they doing this? Oh, look what they're doing with their body. Well, look what they're doing with their language. Notice what they're focusing on. Ah, and why? Look, there's the fear showing up. And then notice how we change it so that when you leave here, you'll have a greater appreciation for every human being you meet, whether it be your child or whether it be the person you can't stand. And you'll understand why. Now, Tawny, would you stand back up? Now, now, Tawny, you're not feeling too depressed right now. What are you feeling right now? Elated. Elated, ladies and gentlemen. And you look it. Now, notice her smile. Does she have a different quality of smile there, yes or no? Yes. Now, I want to ask you a question. I'd like you now to diagnose the old pattern, because it wasn't you that you ran, and I'd like you to tell me the truth. Which of these six needs did you meet by getting depressed, and which of these needs, by the way, did you meet by getting pissed off? Start with depressed. Love. Love. How did you get love by being depressed? Well... 
attention from other people, so that's love. Connection and then love. also trying to caress myself out of it, so giving myself the love, too. That's right. On a scale from zero to ten, how much love were you getting by being depressed, truthfully? I think I be it was a lot less than I yeah, thought. She, she's seeing it now through a different state. How many follow this? But back then, how much did you associate the ability to get love, zero to ten, with being depressed? Where would you put it? Yeah, like an eight. Like an eight, okay? Which means nine. <laughs> and the only reason I saw this is because she smiled and she said eight. So closer to a nine, but let's stay with eight just so we can bullshit ourselves. Next. <laughs> what other need have you met in the past by being depressed? Oh, feeling significant. Feeling significant. There we go. By the way, can you give her a hand for that level of honesty, first of all? Oh. How did you get a feeling of significance by having this horrible depression? Uh, well, when I would get attention from other people, it, it, it signified that they really cared for me and that they really loved me. That's right. So if I also, how bad was it? I mean, how significant was this depression? It wasn't measly ass little depression. It's I can't stop crying depression, right? So how, how, how difficult, how significant was it, zero to 10? It was like a 10. A 10. So now we've met her need for love at an eight, really a nine. We met our significance at a 10 by having this problem. What other needs were you meeting by being depressed? Stability. Stability is a big one. Certainty. How certain were you that you could get yourself in that state? A seven. A seven. Okay. And how certain were you that you could be in that state and stay in that state if you wanted to be? Zero to ten. A ten. Ten. So she meets her needs for certainty at a ten, her needs for significance at a ten, and love at a nine. Anytime you associate at least three elements, you become totally addicted to it. But she doesn't just meet them, she meets them at nines and tens. If you met them at fives and sixes, you'd get addicted, but nines and tens, it's a total addiction. If we don't go any further, how many can see why, even though she could feel total ecstasy, joy, happiness, hopefulness, love at will, just as quickly, how many can see why she was always depressed? Because it was a way of meeting her at an addictive level. Any other needs you're meeting by getting in this state of depression? Things are going a certain way over and over, day after day a certain way. What could you do when you got depressed? Oh, the rush. Yes, the rush of depression. Do you guys hear this? What is that rush? A feeling, all your feelings, right? Feelings you weren't feeling before, which is known as variety. Uncertainty. Zero to ten, how much of a rush? Oh, I could go to a ten. Ten. So why would she be happy when she's got this unhappiness thing working so well? She gets connection and love, she has significance, and she doesn't have to do anything, she doesn't have to take any risks, doesn't have to face anything, doesn't have to create anything. She can have a total rush in her body. In fact, she can rush herself to the point she can cry uncontrollably, which means really feel again and feel the feminine side of herself, which is allow herself to just feel. But then, that's not very acceptable to stay in that state long term, because people get tired of you whining ass all the time. So you need another weapon to show people that you're not just some wuss and that you're to be reckoned with because after a while she gets tired of feeling that sad feelings after a while it feels insignificant doesn't it and weak so then we snap into significant feelings that come from being pissy and intense I'll whip your ass or what was the term you gave me earlier something like I'll kick your ass I'll kick your ass yeah something like I'll kick your ass that wasn't the first time you've ever used that phrase was it no. I like that one yeah use it a lot so now what we do is we whip ourselves into this state, and which needs do you meet by being in the state of I'll kick your ass? Well, probably all of those, too. Yes. Take a moment to review some of your typical ways of meeting your needs. Is there a problem that stands out above everything else? Is it a quality problem, a risky decision that will create progress in your life and the lives of others? Or is it a lingering safe problem that relieves you from making a risky decision. Significance at zero to ten. How, when you're pissed off, how, how certain do you feel in your body on a zero to ten, everybody? How certain? Ten. When you're pissed off, people tend to respond to you even if they don't like you. How significant do you feel? Ten. And by the way, you get connection with people. You don't get love, but you get connection with people. 
So now you got three of them met instantaneously. That's why most people are so angry all the time because it's their addiction to try to feel significant when they feel insignificant. So one way to battle your own fear that you're not enough is get pissed off at something or someone or everyone else. So now the only hope for you as a solution, besides awareness, is to humiliate yourself if you go into those places by realizing I'm being a bitch. And what I'm doing is stealing from my friends by creating a problem that I totally could shift this fast. They don't deserve that, and I'm not going to do that to my own spirit. And then it's to find some new ways to do it, like ways like feeling this hopefulness or this happiness or this elation by realizing I am growing. And because I'm growing, I can pass this on to my sisterhood or my brotherhood or my children. I can grow and I can contribute, and that's where you'll be euphoric. Because the feelings you're having today are only so good. They only last so long. What they really last is when it becomes not about you, when it becomes outside yourself and you, when all of it's fulfilled. But the place that'll get you back is when you get around men. Because they're going to do shit to be significant. It's going to piss you off because you know you're significant. And you're not going to want to feel insignificant. Who here can relate to this at some level? Let me see a show of hands. Very nice. Give her a big hand. Thank you very much.